All right, who's ready to learn about how the RSA algorithm actually works in a complete way and why it works the way it does? So we kind of introduced last time quickly to say that this is how you do encryption. It's just message to the um, public exponent mod n. And decryption is you take that ciphertext and raise it to power d mod n, where d is a secret and e is a public exponent. Um, so what we want to ask today is, why and how does this actually work? And uh, how can we generate these E and D and N values so that we actually get security for RSA and, and what does that even mean? Um, so let's, let's look at this example and this will hard, help us start to think about what we need to do. Um, so we wanna transmit this message. Uh, this is just a toy message that I said. And here's the public and private key. So again, the idea of the public key is that everyone knows this. You can uh, put this public key on your website or on your Twitter profile or whatever. And the private key, of course, only Bob should be able to know that. And the, the reason for that is that anyone, such as Alice, can encrypt a message and only Bob can decrypt it. And so what would you do if you're trying to transmit a message? You first have to encode that message into numbers. And so we're not really focusing on this step, but this is called encoding. If you're sending text, then uh, usually break it into blocks and probably use the ASCII values. I didn't use the ASCII values here, but that's probably a more sensible thing to do. Then you have to encrypt. So this is the actual RSA encryption is raising to the public exponent mod n. And then you get these numbers out that um, the idea is that anyone that looks at these numbers, they just like look like random numbers modulo n. Notice that they're gonna have roughly the same size as n because they're, they're mod n numbers. And then to decrypt, um, so Bob is just gonna take this ciphertext, start with that and run the, not running the process in reverse, but using his uh, private exponent d. So notice that Alice uses the public exponent e and Bob uses the private exponent d but always mod n, so that the mods are the same, but the exponents are different. And what he gets out at the end is the same um, sequence of plain text numbers, 261 and 400 in this example, um, as whatever Alice sent. So that's the idea of encryption and decryption. There's another time for me to just emphasize again that there's a lot of other important things that you wouldn't probably use RSA in exactly this way to do encryption. And so if you're interested in like, what are all those practical things, um, you should take the IT430 class. Um, if you're not taking that class, you should use a built-in library that does in, you know, encryption and decryption for you. Well, we're trying to think about it from the algorithmic side to really understand the, the bones of how does this work. Okay, now why does this work? What we really need is that this m to the d, so that's like the ciphertext, when we raise that to the private exponent, we get back the original message m. So this is the equation that we need to have be satisfied no matter what the message m is. And we can think about, we actually already know at this point the math that goes into what, what do we need this public and private um, exponent to satisfy. So think about this as if we're trying to compute it. So m to the d to the e is really the same as m to the d e mod n. And remember, when we're talking about modular exponentiation, the very last trick is that we said you can always take the exponent modulo the totient of the modulus. The exponent modulo the totient of the modulus. So that means that if we know phi of n, we can say that this is equal to m to the d e mod phi of n mod n, right? So this mod is in the exponent mod phi of n, and then the regular exponentiation is mod n. And so if we want this to equal m, what should this exponent be? Well, I think you know. If you want m to the something to equal m, we need this exponent to equal 1, right? Because m to the 1 is equal to m. And so that's how key generation works is um, we're going to pick our n first, which is going to be the product of two big primes. There are security reasons for that, but also um, we need to be able to compute phi of n, right? Um, and so we use that information to compute the modular inverse of 
the public exponent, that's going to give us the private exponent. So if you were wondering, like, why does, why does totient matter? Why does modular exponentiation matter? Why does modular inverse matter? These things all come in with RSA. They have other important applications in computing as well, but they happen to all be important um, for this RSA key generation. So again, what are we going to do to generate the public and private keys? We, we generate the public and private key at once, and then you only publish the public key. Uh, so you generate your modulus, which is the product of two large primes. Then you pick a uh, public exponent. And the only rule, so you can read this, the really the only rules is that the public exponent has to be relatively prime to the uh, phi of n. Right, so the GCD of E and phi of n needs to equal one. So it can't share any common factors with the with phi of n. And then we compute the modular inverse to get the private exponent. And why is uh, why is this work? Is because we're able to compute phi of n. We know because we know the factorization as per whoever's doing the key generation knows that this is equal to p minus one times q minus one, because you've already computed n equals p times q. And that's kind of the whole idea, which we'll get into in a second. But the, the, the idea behind the security is that someone that doesn't know the factorization of n can't figure out what phi of n is either, and therefore can't figure out what the private exponent is. OK, so now we've, we've seen how RSA works very quickly. Um, but it's really just modular exponentiation with the public key to encrypt, then modular exponentiation with the private key to decrypt. Now we have to ask, well, how big does n need to be? Um, how big should p and q be? Um, th these are questions that um, we need to understand in order to make sure that we have an algorithm which can be actually usable. So if we make everything too huge, then it's going to take really long to just like encrypt messages and the, the whole scheme will be useless. But if we don't make them big enough, then it'll be easy for someone else to maybe factor that number and come up with uh, to be able to crack it. So that's the that's the important question. It's one of the reasons why we're looking at this besides I think it's interesting and it leads into some other things we're going to learn about. And it's some cool ways of thinking about algorithms. It's also uh, one of those places where analysis of algorithms is really, really important because we have to have a good understanding of how fast are the operations that we want to be fast and how slow are the operations that we want to be slow. And uh, so that's that's kind of the questions that we're going to look at here. And, and so there's three things that we could think about. There's key generation. So we just talked about this. This is like um, choosing the primes and um, calculating the... the um, public and private exponents. Um, there's encrypting and decrypting with the proper keys. So like the encrypting and decrypting that should be allowable. So this is just modular exponentiation. And then there's decrypting without the private key. So this is like cracking, cracking the crypto system, um, which would be bad. We want this to, to not be possible. And so when we're thinking about what would it take for this to be like secure and usable, we want the key generation um, should be fast. It should be reasonable to do key generation um, because you know we, we should be able to generate keys, hopefully on our own. But even if that's not totally fast, it's even more important that the encrypting or decrypting is really fast. So I'm going to say faster or fastest. Uh, we want encryption and decryption to really be fast. Because you might only have to generate your key once or once a year or something, but you're going to have to encrypt and decrypt all the time. And if so if it takes a little bit longer time to generate the keys, that's kind of okay. But we need the encryption and decryption to be as fast as possible. And then decrypting without the private key. So we're usually focused on getting fast algorithms, but we have also looked at some examples in class of when we can reason that any algorithm for a problem is slow. And that's what we want to be going on here. So we want this to be very, very slow. That's what we want. Um, and not just like slower than it costed encrypt or decrypt, but like order, many orders of magnitude slower. 
And in fact, really what we want is that these first two are polynomial time. If you remember some concept that came up at the beginning of this unit was the um, cobham Edmonds thesis, which just basically says that if something is more than polynomial time, then it's intractable. If something is polynomial time, then it might be tractable. And polynomial time means, in terms of the size of the input, means like linear or quadratic or cubed or so anything like that. And uh, so we want this cracking, decrypting without the private key, to be like hopefully exponential time or at least more than um, polynomial time. You should be thinking to yourself like in terms of what, right? So we can um, say that something is fast or slow, but when we say fast or slow in this class, what we're really talking about is the growth rate, right? The, um, when we say that, for example, selection sort is kind of a slower algorithm for sorting. What we don't mean that selection sort is always going to be slow, no matter any list that you give it. What we mean is that as the input size gets larger, selection sort gets much slower at a faster rate than like merge sort gets slower. So every algorithm is going to be slower with larger input size. And the question when we're talking about fast or slow algorithms is how quickly do they um, slow down as the input size increases. And so in the case of RSA, and really any uh, cryptographic algorithm, the runtime should be in terms of the key length. And in this case, it really means like the number of bits in the modulus for us. So we've talked many times about like how the size of numbers affects the running time of various algorithms. And that's what really matters here. So we really wanna say, what key length can I pick so that uh, see, if we have fast algorithms for these and very slow algorithms in terms of the growth rate for cracking, what that means is that there's going to be a key length that I can pick that's large enough where these fast algorithms haven't gotten too slow yet, and this slow algorithm for cracking is like astronomically or beyond astronomically long that it would take um, in order to crack it. And uh, so in order to understand this, there's just a couple more things we have to understand. I think we understand pretty well the um, encrypting or decrypting with the proper keys. We talked about those different techniques for modular exponentiation. And uh, so those are reasonably fast. The square and multiply algorithm is basically the coming to save the day there. We also talked about what does it take to crack this? This is basically large integer factorization. And we already talked about how um, that's a slow problem that there nobody knows a polynomial time algorithm for that and people have looked very hard and so the only thing to clear up a little bit is um, what's the actual like computational cost of choosing this public private key pair and uh, so for that we have to be able to test for primes why is that well the algorithm to choose a random prime um, I'll kind of write out a pseudocode of this algorithm right now you maybe can guess what it's going to be based on the title of the slide. But here's how it's going to work. So if I wanted to, I'll write this in kind of Python syntax. Um, if we want a random prime with b bits, what you do is you have an infinite loop to pick a random number. So I'll say p or n equals random b bit number. Maybe you would make n be odd, but you don't even have to. And then we say, if n is prime, then return n. And that's the algorithm. So you're just gonna keep picking random numbers over and over and over again until you hit one that's a prime. Um, and the reason why this works is because, as it says right here, one in every k integers with k bits, or I guess, so b integers with b bits is a prime. And what that means is that you have to only have to try, only need about uh, b tries before this loop succeeds. Like if you think about like rolling a, a die, how long do you have to roll until you roll a six? On average, six times, because there's six numbers on the die, and uh, so you have a one in six chance of hitting it every time. But the bad news is that um, we have to, come up with some creative way to actually do this primality testing. So this testing whether n is prime, that's the thing that's really going to slow down this 
um, whole step. And so there's a long history behind um, testing for primality and different kinds of primality tests. It's something that's been interesting to mathematicians and computer scientists for a long time. So the idea behind primality testing is to use uh, Fermat's little theorem. So this came up a little while ago when we were talking about Totian function. So Fermat's little theorem says that for any number, um, for any modulus n and any a, we have a to the power of phi of n is going to be 1 um, modulo n. There are some restrictions on what a is, but um, basically as long as a is non-zero or in some uh, relative primality to n or something, uh, this is basically always going to be true. Now, that was useful when we were able to, when we we're thinking about modular exponentiation because it allowed us to reduce the exponent mod phi of n, right? But we can also use this to test for primality. So the cool idea with testing for primality is you say, um, well, here's this property that prime numbers would have. Now I'm going to check if my number does this thing that all prime numbers would do. So rather than directly like trying to find the factors of the number, that would be hard. Instead, we're going to say, well, here's a property that every prime number has. So let me test whether my number has that property. And if it does, then I'll say, OK, seems like it's probably prime then. Um, so that is the idea of what we're going to do. So what if n is prime? Well, if n is prime, and in fact, this is only true if n is prime, then phi of n, the totion of n, is equal to n minus 1. We, we saw that. Right. What is this saying is that if it's a prime number, then every um, number between 1 and n minus 1 doesn't have any common factors with n. OK, so we know that that's true. So then we can say that if n is prime, then a to the n minus 1 would equal 1 modulo n, if n is prime. Now, it's not saying that this can never happen if n is not prime. But what it's saying is that if n is prime, then this is always going to happen. And so now we can use this as, as a basic kind of primality test. So the algorithm would be, this is actually an algorithm that's a primality test. It's called the Fermat primality test. And it turns out that there are, unfortunately, some numbers that have to do with the factorization of n minus 1. There's some numbers where this, this, this just doesn't work for. And so the actual um, primality test is this slightly more complicated one that was invented by uh, two computer scientists, um, Miller and Rabin. And this is a provably um, functionable primality test. And what it does is essentially the same thing. But what you'll see is that, so we start with this exponent d being n minus 1. So there's this initial loop where we divide out um, the powers of 2 from n minus 1. And we do kind of that part of the exponentiation separately. So if you, if you work through this algorithm, and remember this double star thing means exponentiation. So this is like a to the d mod n. This is x squared mod n. It's ultimately raising x to the power n minus 1. Uh, sorry, raising a to the power n minus 1 and checking if it ends up being... Um, one too soon or if it gets to the end um, but there's just some slight details about where we have to do the checks and dealing separately with the powers of two those details aren't important for us because we're not number theorists that are trying to devise this but just suffice it to say that it's based on kind of this idea that here's a property that every prime number has so now we'll check um, we'll pick some random numbers to check whether this this n that we're given actually has this property, and then it might be a prime. And then you're going to repeat this over and over again um, with different a values to get more confidence that it is. So this particular algorithm as it is, it turns out that it doesn't always succeed. right? So this is called a probable prime um, test. We can definitely get unlucky here. What would it mean to be unlucky? Well. 
if the algorithm returns uh, false, so if you think back to the, the previous example, if the algorithm returns false, that means that it's definitely not a prime. But if it returns true, then it might be actually composite. And so the unlucky situation is that n is not a prime, but this algorithm um, returns true. And that is possible, but it turns out the probability of that happening is less than um, 3 fourths. In fact, the probability is even much less than that, but that's a bound that we know on the probability of this happening. So what that says is that um, it, you can get unlucky, but we know that at least one fourth of the time you won't be unlucky. Now that doesn't sound like great odds if you're trying to win a bunch of money or something like that, but what can we do? We can repeat this over and over and over and over again. Um, and just to give you some estimate, so we said that the, what's the probability that you get unlucky um, one time is three fourths, at most three fourths. So that's a 75% chance that if you run this once, you might have the wrong answer. Well, what would happen if you run it 10 times? Think about it. If you ever, you, if you're getting the wrong answer after running this 10 times, that means that you were unlucky 10 times in a row. Because if you ever get lucky, right, if you ever actually find the witness, then that tells you the number is not a prime. If it's not prime now, then it's not prime tomorrow. Um, so what's the chance after 10 tries, chance of being unlucky every time? It would be p to the power 10, which is already down to 5%. And 5%, um, maybe that sounds pretty good. I wouldn't be that confident with 5% chance of my banking credentials being hacked or something. So we can crank this up. And it's going to be an exponential time growth. So what about 40 tries? Maybe it'll be like four times smaller. Maybe it'll be around 1%. Well, if you... So take a guess of what you think this is going to be. It's not going to be around 1%. It's going to be way, way, way smaller than that. So this is a scientific notation now. There's, there's five missing zeros at the front of this. Um, and if you, so now this is already getting towards, you know, one in a few thousand chance of being unlucky. If we wanted to do this, you know, a hundred times, then it's going to be, that now this is in the realm of you'd be more likely to win the lottery than to have it fail 100 times in a row. And so that's the idea of how we can test for primality. What's really interesting to me is that this is a probabilistic algorithm. So it, it might not, there's a small chance always that you're getting the wrong answer. Um, if you're told that a number is prime, there's a small chance that it's not really prime. There have been developed faster, sorry, there have been developed polynomial time algorithms to definitively say that always work, that always give a correct answer, there's no probabilistic stuff in them. Nobody uses those algorithms because they're slower. And so this primality test, even though it's probabilistic, this is the one that actually gets used in practice still um, because it's so much faster than the even more complicated ways of telling for sure whether a number is prime or not. And so what we get overall are for k-bit encryption, we have, uh, it's going to be k to the fourth time. Now, I didn't go through the details of why that is. Um, you can read more about that in the notes. But that's just allowing for the cost of, you know, what does this algorithm really have to do? It's, it's actually this modular exponentiation on this step that turns out to be the most expensive one. And then you have to repeat it a number of times. So it ends up being like the bit length to the power 4. And uh, regular encryption and decryption, so once you, after you've done key generation, that turns out to be k cubed time in terms of the bit length. And uh, that's good. So what this means is that encryption, decryption, and key generation, all those things that we wanted to be reasonably fast, like we said that this should be fast. It's fast enough. Um, it's to the fourth power, but it's polynomial in terms of the bit length. Um, we said that encryption and decryption should be really fast and it, it's faster. And then we said that cracking should be slow. Um, so that is the last thing that we have to kind of convince ourselves of. Um, again, we don't, we aren't able to get into all the number theoretic details of this proof. 
but we can connect some of the things that we've been looking at here. So what do we have to connect? Is first of all, if the only way to decrypt a message is to have this private key. Um, and actually there, if the message is sufficiently random, this is, uh, you, can, you can prove that. Um, then the only way to get that private key is to first compute phi of n. In a way, yes, you can prove that as well. And the only way to compute that phi of n is to, fac is to have the factorization of n, like p times q. Um, and I could show you the proof of that, but I think we don't have enough time for it. But if somebody asks really nicely, maybe um, I would show you the idea of that. And, uh, and then this final step is what it all depends on. So when we're talking about security of like cryptographic algorithms, we'd like it to depend on just one hard problem. And in the case of RSA, this is the hard problem, um, which is integer, large integer factorization. What's interesting is that we don't have a proof that this is actually hard. So far, many, many people have tried to come up with fast algorithms for large integer factorization. There's been a lot of attempts to prove a lower bound, like how we saw a lower bound that sorting has to take at least this many steps. There's been many attempts to prove that. There's also been many attempts to come up with a fast algorithm to do it. So far, there's been some progress, but um, nothing to really definitively say that uh, integer factorization cannot be done in polynomial time. Um, but we rely on this every day in the uh, security of our communications online and even with government secrets and things like that. Um, so the, the kind of community in the world has tried long and hard enough to solve this that we kind of believe, and there is some theory behind it, just not, um, you know, start to finish proofs uh, to say that it's impossible. We do believe that this is not going to be solvable in polynomial time. Um, if somebody comes up with that, if one of you comes up with the polynomial time algorithm to do integer factorization, um, then let me know so we can decrypt all the world's uh, or some of the world's uh, secret communication and uh, become famous and rich. But otherwise, uh, we just have to live with the uh, uncertainty there when we use something like an RSA algorithm. Oh, sorry, the last thing I'll say is uh, it just in terms of teasing you some things about the future, I always try to tease you with more things we don't have to, time to talk about in class, is that um, in the quantum world, if large quantum computers can exist, which is still kind of uncertain, but if they can, then integer factorization of one of, is one of the things they'll be able to do quickly. And so there's a lot of work now um, within the government, within academia, and uh, within the computer security research area of using what's called post-quantum encryption, which is to come up with other methods like besides RSA that are provably hard in ways that we'll talk about towards the end of the class with NP hardness um, in order to say that even if there's quantum computers, then you still wouldn't be able to crack this. Okay, so that's um, what we've talked about in this unit. A lot of math, a lot of number theory stuff in this unit, but it's all about the algorithms for us, right? So it's all about understanding how do we actually get these things done in the computer? How do we analyze these algorithms? And why? And, and one of the big things in this unit is about why is that analysis important? Um, and, and why is it important to understand when we want things to be fast, like primality testing, and when we want things to be slow, like integer factorization? Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed, and we'll be on to bigger and better things starting next class.